What's going on, Life Bridge? How are we? Good. Hey, it's good to see you guys. Have you ever gotten the chance to handle a sword? That's a, it's a good time. It's a good time. I've gotten a chance to handle a couple broad swords before. Those are the really huge ones like you see in Braveheart, which makes me just like William Wallace, right? I don't know why the, you, y'all laugh too. Like, I don't know why that's so funny anyway. Um, but I'm talking about, have you ever had the chance to handle a real sword? I'm talking a sharpened, this will mess you up real fast sword. They're, they're, they're actually pretty intense and pretty intimidating. And clearly you wouldn't want to be on the wrong end of one of these. And this is why I'm excited about today because in today's letter that we're going to read, they're swords. Everything gets better when you start talking about swords. Like today was one of the reasons why I've been looking forward to this series for a few months now, because there's some really good stuff in this letter. There's some really good stuff in all seven of them. But today is also the reason why I was bracing myself going into this series, because there's some intense things in here. There's some things that are hard to hear and that are, are hard to listen to, and they're pretty convicting. Now, this is true of me, and I'm, I'm guessing this is probably true of you also. I don't like to be convicted. Like, I don't like to be called out. Even if it's from someone that cares about me and loves me, like, it can sting to get called out. And even though it's a good thing, one of the things that I've learned to love about Kelly over the years is that she will tell me what I don't want to hear. Like, she's just not going to tell me all the things I want to hear. No, she will flat out tell me when I'm being a fool. She'll straight up, she'll tell me, she'll tell me, hey, uh, you're off base, Matt, or hey, you know what, you're, you're walking into a problem that I don't think you see coming. And, and nobody really likes that. Nobody likes to be told that they're wrong. Nobody likes to hear that they're not being helpful or even worse, that they're being hurtful. Nobody wants to hear that. But the reason why she tells me those things is because she loves me. Proverbs 26, seven says, the wounds of a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses, meaning, a person that doesn't really care about you, they're just gonna tell you what you wanna hear. They're always gonna tell you that everything's great, that you're great, because they don't really care about you. But someone that stings you by telling you something gracious, it's true, but they tell you in a kind way, even though it's meant for you to be cared for, it's meant for you to thrive, that sting that comes from that, that can be trusted. That's today's letter. Jesus has some really good stuff to say, really good stuff to say. But he also has to call out a problem that's in this church. Because if he doesn't, this problem is going to lead to pain if they don't check themselves really quickly. In, in this letter, it's, it's encouraging. There's affirmation in it. And there's also a call out. Those three things, that's, that's what makes this a love letter. So if you're brand new to LifeBridge, if you're joining us in the, in the building for the first time, or you're joining us online, we are in the third week of a, a series that we're calling Letters to My Future Self. Jesus wrote seven specific letters to seven local churches about what he thought about their church and what he wanted the church to look like. But these letters aren't just for these churches way back when. This is what Jesus thinks about the church right now and what he wants the church, like LifeBridge, to look like right now. We've already heard what he had to say to the churches in Ephesus and Smyrna. Today, we're going to read the letter that he writes to the church in Pergamum. So Pergamum was a powerful city, really powerful city. The Roman governor for the Asian province lived in Pergamum. So it was a very political, politically strong place. It was also an intellectual hub. They had a library of 100,000 volumes. That's a lot of books, especially for the ancient world. Pergamum was also the religious center for all of Asia. This was the religious center of all of Asia. Four major cults were headquartered there, worshiped there. There were temples to them. Anywhere you walked in the city, you could see altars and shrines, people worshiping all different kinds of gods, doing all different kinds of things. I'm not gonna say what, because I'm gonna keep it PG-13. And on top of that, the Roman imperial cult was headquartered in Pergamum. Now, we talked about that a little bit last week. The Roman imperial cult, they worshiped Rome as an empire, they worshiped the empire, and they worshiped Caesar as God. If you didn't worship with the cult, if you didn't participate, if you didn't worship the empire, if you didn't worship Caesar, then you were considered unpatriotic and a threat. I mean, this place was the definition of religious nationalism. And this is what got the Christians in a lot of hot water. They took some heat for this, not only because they weren't willing to worship false gods, but because they weren't willing to worship the empire or Caesar. They took some heat for that. In fact, get this, Christians were considered to be atheists. Like no joke, 
not just in Pergamum, but throughout the Roman Empire, they were considered to be atheists because they rejected the Roman gods. They were accused of hating. They were accused of hating the human race because of their exclusivity and their intolerance of other gods. They were hated. They said, they said Christians hated people because Christians said Jesus is the only God, the only God to be worshiped, and he's the only God for everyone. Being, in call, being called intolerant, being called a bigot, being called hateful, that's what was going on. And that sounds like a lot of rhetoric we hear today, doesn't it? Well, we'll get to that. Here's the letter that Jesus writes. It's in Revelation chapter two, starting in 12. He says, write this letter to the angel of the church in Pergamum. This is the message from the one with the sharp two-edged sword. I know that you live in the city where Satan has his throne. Yet you've remained loyal to me. You refused to deny me even when Antipas, my faithful witness, was martyred among you there in Satan's city. Satan's city. Wow. Like, you know, if that's the way that Jesus describes your city where you live, use your imagination for how rough that place was. But this is also pretty comforting to hear this. Because what Jesus is saying, he's saying, I, I know where you live. I know what's going on around you. I know your context. I know the hostility. I know the tension. I know what's going on where you live. I see what you're facing. What would he say to, about Northern Colorado today? What would he say about our country today? Hey guys, I know about all the division that's happening. I know what's going on in your country. I know about all the anger and the fear and the division. I know about the pressure to cave. I know about the pressure to conform. And I know what the truth really is. With everything that's going in our, on in our country, all of the division and the hate and the fear and the hostility, don't get sucked down into that mess. That is a vortex that will just drag you deeper and deeper and deeper if you let it. If you let it. Stay above it. And don't worry about what's gonna happen next. Don't be paralyzed. Don't paralyze yourself by playing the what if game. The more toxic and tense things get, let that be a reminder for you to look up. Look up at the one who knows what happened yesterday, who knows what's happening right now, and who knows what's gonna happen tomorrow. He knows where we live. He knows what's going on right now. That should give us great comfort. Remember that the Lion of Judah is greater than a donkey or an elephant. Just remember that. Keep looking up. This is what he's saying to the Christians in Pergamum. Because this church, man, they faced some serious persecution. They had a guy in their church get killed for his faith. Praise God we haven't had that happen in our church. They had a guy in their, the, the guy in their church, somebody that hangs out in the lobby, somebody that serves, one of their leaders, he got killed for his faith in Jesus. Jesus says, I saw all that. And I see how you're loyal to me. I see your faithfulness. I see how you're standing firm in your faith. I see how you do it when people come after you. Even when your boy Antipas was killed. Like you watched that happen. You knew that that could happen to you too. And you didn't deny me. Well done. Well done. Not only did Jesus see where they lived and everything that was going on with them, not only does he see all of the mess that we live in, he also sees you when you stand strong in the middle of it. He sees you when you're faithful and you don't cave when people come at you. He sees how you're loyal to him. He sees how you don't deny him when there's pressure to conform. And he says to that, well done. It's not lost on him. It's not ignored. Well done. Everybody wants to hear their dad say well done to them. To have your, your dad say well done daughter, well done son. I mean, that takes the cake, right? To hear your father say that. It's infinitely better when Jesus says it to you. Well done. He's encouraging him. He's affirming their steadfastness. He's, he's affirming their strength. He's affirming their faithfulness but he's also got to call them out. Sometimes the thing that you don't want to hear is the best thing that you can hear. It doesn't mean that it won't hurt. It doesn't mean that it won't sting, but it's meant for you to thrive. That's what Jesus says. He says this, but I got a few complaints against you. You tolerate some people whose teaching is like that of Balaam, who showed Balak how to trip up the people of Israel. He taught them to sin by eating food offered to idols and by committing sexual sin. 
In a similar way, you have some Nicolotians among you who follow the same teaching. So repent of your sin or I will come to you suddenly and fight against them. Not everybody, the people that are teaching this. I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. So Balaam and Balak. Can you imagine being named that? Parents didn't like him. Balaam and Balak. Balak was a king back in the Old Testament. This story's in the book of Numbers. Balak was a king and he wanted to wipe out the Israelites. He wanted to take them out. So he goes and gets this prophet named Balaam. And he says, hey, Balaam, I want you to curse the Israelites for me. And Balaam's like, you can't. Like I've tried to curse them before. And every time I, I start to curse them, blessing just comes out of my mouth. So you, you can't fight them on the outside. You can't curse them. You can do nothing to the outside of them because their God is too legit. And everybody here that remembers MC Hammer is ready to start singing right now. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, you can Google it later, okay? But he says, you can't touch them from the outside. And the same thing is true for Satan. Jesus says in Matthew that the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. Gates are defensive. As the church, we don't have to play defense. We get to play offense. Satan, the enemy, can do nothing to the church from the outside. That's what Balaam says. He says, you can't touch them from the outside. If you really want to mess them up, you got to trip them up on the inside. You got to get them to conform to you. It's the only way you can mess them up. He says, you got to get them to start worshiping your gods. Get them to do that. All the ceremonies you do, the, the crazy idolatry, get them to do that. Get them to worship your idols. And then at the same time, send your young women in amongst the men to have them seduce them. Get them to practice your idolatry and get them to sin sexually. That's how you'll trip them up. And that's exactly what happened. Now, we don't know exactly what the Nicolotians were teaching in Pergamum. But what Jesus says is something similar. There's probably people in the church teaching other people in the church that it's totally cool to participate with the imperial cult. You can do that. I mean, you guys can go just because you're Christians. Doesn't mean you can't go to the, to the feasts and the parties that the Roman imperial cult throws. You guys can go. It's totally fine. P partake in it. Here's what would have happened. The Roman imperial cult threw all kinds of massive parties, huge parties. And if you went, every single individual would go and you would start off by taking a little bit of incense and burning that in front of a statue of the emperor to acknowledge him as God, to worship him as God. And then they would sacrifice all of this food as an honoring offering to Caesar as God. And then everybody would eat it as an acknowledgement that Caesar is God. And then the Romans were known for breaking out into all sorts of sexual sin at these parties. Again, I'm, I'm going to keep it PG-13, but there's some people in the church at Pergamum saying, that's totally cool. Hey, you guys can be Christians. You can follow Jesus. You can worship Jesus. And you can do this stuff with the Roman imperial cult. It's fine. You can take some of the things that we see in our culture. You can worship some of their gods and, and take those practices. Hey, don't worry about sexual sin. Because of grace, we've got, our, we've got our sin forgiven. So there is no such thing as sexual sin anymore. You can do all of that and worship Jesus. They're teaching them false things. It's all false teaching. You got people in the church at Pergamum telling other people to conform to the world. And Jesus says, no. We face this too. You are being taught things every single day. Between having a screen in front of you the majority of the day or, or whenever you want it to be, podcasts, radio, the ability to connect with anyone at any moment, anywhere in the world on any topic through your phone. Every single day we're being sold a new idea or concept or teaching. Even more so today, we're being sold fear and division and anger and conspiracy and being sold that the other side, whoever that is, the other side, they're the problem. Media outlets, CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, whoever you want to put in there, social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, media outlets, social media is not media anymore. They're teachers. You and I are being taught every single day. So how do we know what's false and what's true? Most of the time, you and I can tell pretty quickly if something's egregiously false, right? But the most dangerous kind of false teaching is teaching that tastes the truth and it just twists it ever so slightly to the point where it, it seems insignificant, it seems harmless, 
It seems good. It even seems right. But what you've done is you've removed the truth entirely. And if you don't conform to that teaching, you're intolerant. It's a big talking point in our world today, isn't it? Tolerance. There's so much value placed on tolerance and so much disdain placed on intolerance. The more tolerant you are, the more educated, empathetic, and correct you are. And the more intolerant you are, the more uneducated, hateful, and bigoted you are. That's our world. A tolerance should mean the skill of living well with people that you disagree with or disagree with you. That's what it should mean. That's not what it means in our world anymore. In our world, tolerance means conformity. That's all it means. Conform to the cultural narrative. Conform to false teaching. Conform to something our world values. And if you don't, if you don't, you're intolerant. But have you ever noticed this? This, this is always interesting to me. If you don't conform to the cultural narrative or one side of the political upheaval or, or put whatever you want in the box, if you don't conform, you're labeled intolerant. But doesn't that seem intolerant in and of itself? That seems really inconsistent, right? Hey, you believe this? Cool. Well, I believe this. Are you kidding me? You're intolerant. Well, you're not tolerating my belief, right? There's not a lot of tolerance that goes around. It's because tolerance is code for conformity. That's what's happening in Pergamum. They're conforming to false teaching and they're conforming to sin. And Jesus says, guys, pump the brakes. Wait, don't go down that path. You don't want to fall into that trap. Why are we so tempted to conform? Every day, you and I are tempted to conform. In fact, we're pressured to conform. It's switching from just temptation to actually pressure. More and more, every day that goes by, you're just pressured to conform more. And the younger you are, the harder it is. If you're a student, you're pressured more than any other age demographic. The stuff that you're pressured to, that if you're in college or in high school, man, I didn't have to deal with that stuff when I was in high school or college. And I wasn't in high school and college that long ago. Every single day, we're pressured to conform to something that goes against Jesus, something that clearly goes against what God's word says. And the warning right here is don't do that. I've said this quote before. It's from a pastor who was in London. His name was Charles Spurgeon. He said, there is nothing in God's word that is meant to rob you joy, only that that would deny you pain. There is nothing about Jesus. There is nothing about the Bible that is meant to rob you of any kind of joy, any kind of joy. In fact, it's the opposite. It's meant to give you more joy, joy that's real and has substance to it. And it's meant to deny you the pain that comes with sin and comes with what our world values. Right here, Jesus is warning the church at Pergamum. He's trying to deny them self-inflicted pain from conforming and he's warning us too. So why would we conform to pain? Why do we conform to the narrative of the world instead of the narrative of God's word? I think the number one reason why is fear. Conformity is a response to fear. I, I still want to be on the wrong side of culture. Well, Christians have always been on the wrong side of pop culture. I, 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 just, I don't want to be labeled as intolerant. I get that, but Christians in the Roman Empire were labeled intolerant, but Jesus labeled them faithful. You can pick which label you want to wear. Well, I just, I just kind of want to blend in. I don't want to cause any ripples and I'd really like to avoid the wrath that comes from people because people are mean. I get that, man, people are mean. It just seems like anger is the initial response to everything right now. I get it, man, there's, there's days where, man, I, I don't want to deal with people calling me names. I hate it when people point their finger at me. I don't like being on the opposite side of something that our world values and then what comes at me for that. Nobody likes that. The idea of, of, of blending in, flying under the radar, not bringing on unwanted attention or heat on, on myself, man, that sounds great. There's plenty of days where I want that to be true for me. But every time I have that temptation to just, hey man, let me blend in, let me fly under the radar, this question just keeps coming back all the time that I have to wrestle with. The question is, how can we blend in if we're called to stand out? How can we blend in if we're called to stand out? Christians, 
the church are called to stand out. Not in obnoxious ways or combative ways, not in the character ways that get painted up in our, in our culture all the time. No, we're called to stand out like Jesus stood out. We're called to stand out as the light of the world. We're called to stand out as servants. We're called to stand out because we stand up on truth. We're called to stand out because of our grace. We're called to stand out because of the way that we love other people. We're called to stand out because we actually do justice. We are called to stand out so other people can stand with Jesus. But if we conform to the things that we're called to stand out from, we lose our calling. You are meant to change the world, not conform to it. Jesus even says that if salt loses its saltiness, what good is it? If salt isn't salty, it's good for nothing. It has no purpose. That's exactly what happens to us when we conform. You throw away your purpose, you throw away your calling. So here's the letter to us right now. Here's the letter to our future self. Conformity is the quickest way to lose your calling. Conformity is the quickest way to lose your calling. God has a purpose for you. He wants you to stand out, not blend in. He wants to use you to bless people in ways that you can never even possibly imagine. That by the way, will bring you so much more joy and satisfaction. He wants to use you so that people get to experience his grace. He wants to use you so that people know the truth so that they don't experience the pain that comes from what our world values and what our world teaches. So don't conform to the divisive dialogue. It makes you blend in. Don't conform to the sexual ethic of our world. It makes you blend in. Don't conform to materialism. It makes you blend in. Don't conform to the ever-changing cultural narrative. It makes you blend in. Don't blend in. Stand out. Live out your calling. And I know this is hard. Like I'm not, this, is, this is easy for me to stand up here and say this. Living it out is a whole other thing. Man, I'm with you. That's hard. But this is just another reason for you to be connected. Because it's really easy to conform when you're alone. But when you're connected, you get sharpened. I think it's Ecclesiastes 3 where it says three cords are bounded together are not easily broken. When you're connected with other people in the church, it's hard to be broken. It's hard to conform. It sharpens you. When you're connected with other people, you can learn with each other. You can learn from each other. You can encourage each other. You can ask questions together. You can share what you're struggling with, what you're doubting. You grow together. You stay strong together. Maybe the next step for you to do that is get connected through Rooted. We're starting up Rooted next month, and we've got some Rooted groups going on in the spring. It's a great way to get connected and grow with other people. In fact, this is also why we want to build out our discipleship pathway as a church much more. Rooted's fantastic, and we want more than that. We want more ways for people to get connected, more ways for all of us to take step forward and take our next step and grow. We're gonna roll some of that stuff out in the fall. This is another reason to get connected and serve. Not only do you get to live on mission, which, which by the way, will grow you, but when you're on a volunteer team, you know more people. You're connected, you're not alone. It's easy to conform when you're alone. It's hard not to grow and be sharpened when you're connected. The other consequence to conforming is that you're not being faithful to Jesus. That seems obvious, but we need to hear that. You can conform to the world or you can be faithful to Jesus. You can't do both. It's one or the other and you gotta pick. Romans 12, two says, don't be conformed to this world. And if you have a church background at all, maybe you've heard the, the translation, don't be conformed to the pattern of this world. Don't be conformed to the world, but instead be transformed by the renewal of your mind so that you may test and discern the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. It's a classic verse. The New Testament was originally written in Greek. The Greek word for repentance means change your mind. It's all about repentance, renewing your mind. So what Romans 12 is saying, what the letter to the church in Pergamum is saying a theme that you see sown throughout the entire Bible is this. Be transformed instead of conformed. And we do that by repentance, by the renewal of our mind, by changing our mind. Be willing to change your mind. I've got a really good friend that says, what's the point of having a mind if you're not willing to change it? Be willing to change your mind. And this is for everybody Every single one of us, this is for all of us. If you're not a Christian, 
If you're not sure on this whole Jesus thing, this whole church thing, if you're not a Christian, be willing to change your mind about what you think about Jesus, what you think about the church, what you think about the Bible. And it's okay if you don't know and you don't have questions, just ask them, be willing to change your mind. And if you are a Christian, this is just as much for you and I as it is everybody else. We've gotta be willing to change our mind too. I know this is true of me, so I know that this is true of you. I got plenty of things I need to change my mind about. If I look back on my life, there are plenty of things where, man, I believe this intensely. And then as I grew and, and walked with Jesus more and matured, man, I changed my mind on things. Evaluate everything and see if there's something that you need to change your mind on so that you're transformed to look more like Jesus instead of being conformed to be like the world. Like maybe you need to change the way you think about politics. I think that's all of us. I love those nervous laughs, guys. I love it. I love it. Like maybe you need to change the way you think about money. Or maybe you need to change the way you think about sex. Or maybe you need to change, your way, uh, change the way you think about uh, something that, that's in God's word, that's really clear. Maybe you need to change the way you think about justice and injustice. Maybe you need to think about, change the way you think about how you've got it all figured out as a Christian, that you know exactly what everything's all about. You need to change your mind there. Maybe you need to change your mind the way you think about how you want to interact with people, how you want to talk with them. Maybe you need to change your mind on the way you think that truth is relative. Don't let pride get in the way of you changing your mind from something that the world is trying to sell you to what Jesus is trying to give you. Because the cross of Jesus Christ brings transformation that, is, that stands out and is so much greater than anything else. But our world just demands conformity that makes you blend in and leaves you feeling empty. This is why Jesus says to the church at Pergamon, he says, repent. He says, repent of your sin or I will come to you suddenly and fight against them, the false teachers, the people that are conforming. I will fight you with the sword of my mouth. This is the intense part. This is the part where I was like, okay, let's lean into this. Let me give you some context. It'll bring to life what he's saying. The Roman governor was in, in Pergamum for, for Asia. There's a lot of power there. And the symbol for his power, the symbol for his sovereignty over you and everyone else and every aspect of your life was the sword. The sword was a symbol of his judgment. In fact, since Rome ruled the known world, most of the known world at that time, the sword in the Roman Empire symbolized Rome, symbolized the world's judgments. We don't like judgment. We're not big fans of it, right? Don't judge me. Don't be judgmental. We don't like judgment. We love to talk about justice, but we don't like judgment. Can I point out the error in that? <laughs> yeah, y'all, you're all tracking with me. Judgment and justice, they go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. We don't like judgment, but we're really quick to do it. Our culture is really quick to judge opposing ideas or thoughts or rhetoric. We judge things that we don't like, but here's the truth. Here's the truth. Every single person, you, me, everyone is going to face some kind of judgment. But here's the cool part. You get to pick which one. You get to pick which kind of judgment you face. Jesus says, I'm going to come and fight against you with the sword of my mouth. He's using that, that language on purpose. Many times throughout scripture, the Bible is referred to as a sword. Jesus is using that sword language on purpose. What he's saying is that my sword is greater than Rome's sword. My sword is greater than the world's sword. My judgment is greater and superior to the world's judgment. So here's the truth. And this is what you get to pick. You get to pick. You can be transformed by Jesus and judged by the world, or you can conform to the world and be judged by Jesus. You get to pick. Which judgment do you fear more? There's gonna be multiple moments in our lives, you and me both, there's gonna be multiple moments in our lives where the world is gonna judge something that's right, but that conflicts with what Jesus, Jesus judges to be right. In that moment, what sword are you gonna respect more? Which one? And this is the intense part. It's not fun to hear that. But Jesus says that to us because he loves us. I'm saying it right now. This would be so much easier to just preach John 3, 16. But I'm saying this to you because I love you as your pastor. 
Jesus is saying this because he loves you, because he wants you, because he cares about you, and he wants you to thrive. That's what makes this a love letter. And then just like all of these letters, he ends it with good news. Just all seven of them, he ends with good news. Here's what he says. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he's saying to the churches. Do we hear what he's saying today? Do we understand? To everyone who is victorious, I will give some of the manna that has been hidden away in heaven. And I will give to each one a white stone and on the stone will be engraved a new name that no one understands except the one who receives it. So we're not exactly sure what this symbolizes, but we know that it's good. No matter what you think you miss out on this, in this world because of being faithful to Jesus, pleasure or a narrative, whatever, whatever you think you miss out on because you've been faithful to Jesus, that gets repaid to you 100 fold for eternity. The pleasure that we seek out in this world, there's some pleasure that's great and it's actually a gift from God. But when we seek out pleasure in this world, and man, it's, it's, it's insatiable. You need more and more and more. It's always fleeting. But the pleasure that we have in Jesus for eternity, it never runs out. Psalm 17 actually talks about and says that God has pleasures forevermore in his right hand for you. I wanna know what that's all about. So this manna, it's a symbol of provision, God providing for us. For 40 years, the Israelites wandered in the desert. There's no food in the desert. So every single day, God gave them manna. It's a type of bread, gave them manna every single day. He's saying, I got you. I'll take care of you. I'll feed you. You don't have to worry about it. It's a promise that he's gonna to continue to provide for us no matter what crazy things come at us in this world. On top of that, hidden away in heaven, my guess is that's what we're eating in heaven. The party that we get to be a part of, it's that hidden manna. This white stone, we're not sure exactly what that means either, but at that time in that culture, a lot, of time, a lot of times people would be given little white painted stones as like a ticket into a party or into an event. Maybe that's what Jesus is talking about. And on this one, he says, there's a little name written on it. So picture this, follow me for just a second. One day you are gonna stand face to face with Jesus. You're gonna look him in the eye and he's gonna give you a hug. And that hug is gonna last as long as you want it to. We got nothing but time. And then when you're done with that hug, he's gonna put his arm around you and he's gonna hand you this little white stone. And on this stone is a name written on it. It's a name for Jesus. And this name for Jesus is only for you. Nobody else for all of eternity will know what that name for Jesus is except for you. It's something that the two of you get to share. It's a promise of intimacy. And then when you're ready, he puts his arm around you, keeps it around you, and he walks you into the party. And you walk in and you're walking on streets that are gold, but they're transparent like glass. And there's this strange, intoxicating light. You don't see the sun, there's no moon. Oh, it's from the throne. God's presence lights up this city for eternity. And you hear the music, you hear the singing, and you can't wait to be a part of it. That's why the way we worship every single week, the reason why we do what we do, the style that we do, we're trying to give just a glimpse of heaven. We can't do that entirely, of course, but everything we do with worship, we're trying to give you just a glimpse of what heaven's gonna be like. And you're walking down these streets with Jesus. Every day that you see him on the street, you get to call him out by that name that nobody else knows but you. You get to talk with him whenever you want. Friendships that you had here get restored even more. You see people in heaven that you're like, man, I'm actually surprised you made it. There's gonna be those people there. So be careful how you judge. Everything's gonna be redeemed. The people that, that were physically incapacitated here, you're gonna see them. You're not gonna recognize their physical body, but you're gonna know exactly who they were. And they're perfect now. Their body is perfect. People that you have lost. There are many of you in this room right now where your loved ones, your wife, your husband, your son, your daughter, your best friend is up there right now chilling. They already got their white stone waiting. You get to spend eternity with them too. Work gets completely redeemed, completely redeemed. You are gonna be the expert, the leading expert in your field of work in heaven. And it's gonna be so joyful. It's not gonna be work anymore. It's gonna be your passion and your pleasure that you get to do for all of eternity. And if, if I'm, I'm taking a guess on this right now, everything I'm saying is my, my interpretation from what I see in scripture. 
If I knew exactly, if we knew exactly what it was gonna be like, what we're gonna experience, man, that's all I would ever preach. We'll just stay on that all the time. But we can't, we don't know it entirely. Scripture's clear, the New Testament says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no one can imagine. Nobody can imagine, you can't even dream it up. Our heads, our minds aren't big enough. You have not, you can't even imagine what God has planned for those who love him, who have been faithful to him. Everything that we face in this world, persecution, heartache, fear, division, The pressure to conform, it is so temporary in the scheme of eternity. It is a drop in the bucket. But I know it's hard because it's real tangible right now, right? It's on our face. That pressure to conform, that pressure to blend in. But nobody has imagined what he has planned for those who love him, who don't conform, who don't conform to the false teaching, who don't conform to the narrative of the world, who don't conform to what the world values, who don't conform to sin, but instead every single day are leaning in so that they're transformed by Jesus. It is so worth it. And I'll walk with you too, if you'll walk with me in this. I don't wanna conform. And like you, I got a pressure every single day to do it. Let's not do it. Let's stand strong together because it's gonna be worth it. It's going to be so, so worth it. Don't conform. Jesus, thank you for telling us things that are hard to hear. I mean, it's really easy to stand up here right now and say, hey, let's not conform, guys. It's really easy to say it, but living it out is a whole nother ball game. Would you just give us the strength and remain faithful and not conform to sin, not conform to false teaching, not to conform to the narrative of our world, but to conform to the narrative of your word that you've given us as a gift. Would you give us eyes to see what's going on in our world? Help us to interpret the times like you say in Luke and let us look up when we do. Give us the strength to do this and I pray that Life Bridge would be filled with people that stand out for all of the right reasons that we don't blend in but we stand out for all of the reasons that Jesus stood out for. And let us hold on to that calling. Ah, we love you. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your word. And we have so much hope in that. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.